lovely song to shift us into the next one, uh, Away in a Manger, hymn number 124. Happy Sabbath, Atlanta North. Happy Sabbath, Atlanta North. I love it. Me, you know, I, I like the feedback and I like to hear your faces. It's so nice to see all of us. We should be in a very good mood because most of us are either on vacation, getting to, to, be, uh, to vacation, or should be on vacation soon. So either way, it should be better. Some of us are preparing for some type of, of getting away with family. But those of us that are here, it's nice to be with the Lord and to be able to fellowship together. Um, you know, um, I met a couple people. I see Ben. Is Ben? There's Ben. Ben. Ben um, came to worship with us today. Welcome, Ben. And uh, Gerald. Who's Gerald? There's Gerald. Gerald Wyson. Welcome, welcome. And to all of you that I don't know their names yet or I haven't pointed to you, very welcome. Welcome to Atlanta North. And um, just make this place your home. And, um, and, I, and I say that the more, the merrier. And um, we, have, we have a couple, there's not, there are not uh, too many um, announcements. Of course, the pastors, both of them are um, on vacation or taking care of certain things, and they send their greetings, and they are uh, happy to have each one of you um, as crying and as people, and they want to make sure that I tell you that they'll miss you and that they're very happy um, to, have you, to have you and to worship with you and to pastor all of you. Um, as far as notable announcements, you could read them. If you have your bulletin in the back, we have announcements there. Um, and you could see that today we will have um, Elder Gaines that's going to bring us the word. We'll talk about him a little bit later and in more in depth. There's the Sabbath school program that I want to highlight um, next Sabbath. Um, it's not going to be as broad as we usually do, but there is going to be a Sabbath school program. So come on and um, support it. And the, what I want to underline is that we're going to have a study after that and would like everybody to come and to participate, kind of like a panel um, discussion that we're going to have. But come and support the children. But a lot of the children are going to have their special program in their classrooms. That's one of the different um, parts of that this 13 program. Uh, the um, remind you of our communion service. That's on January 13th. 
um, so that you, you could all prepare for that. And um, uh, although Pastor John's not around, but I will try to remember what he does, but I do know that he does a greeting. And I'd like for you guys to turn to the to next to you, in front of you or behind you, and tell them welcome and make them feel as if they're in the house of the Lord with people that want them. So say hello, tell them welcome, welcome to the land of the Lord, we're happy to have you. <laughs> That's great. Well, with that in mind, um, our call to worship today is taken from John 1, verse 14, and it reads, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the congregation, let me ask you to stand. Father God, most high, eternal God, we ask you to be in our midst today. We thank you for having patience with us, although we do not deserve it in any way. We ask that you forgive us for all the times that we did not represent your character or be the children that you wanted us to be. As we begin our worship, we ask that your spirit may fill this place. May we experience a worship and a service as we have never done before. Be with each and every person that is to commit or do something for this service. Allow us to benefit and allow us to be blessed. Lord, be with us, guide us, protect us. We ask you these things, not that we are worthy in any way, Father, but in your precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We are going to have our opening hymn, and today our opening hymn is number 125 in our Adventist hymnal. It's Joy to the World.
may be seated. As we um, participate in uh, being part of this holiday season, you know, for I want to remind you that we experience generosity of God, and there's none other than in John 3:16 um, that we could think of how generous He is to us. Um, but we love Him because He first loved us, as 1 John 4 verse 19. In the spirit of the holiday season. I've got a, uh, I, 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 I read a Christmas thought that I wanted to share with you all. Um, it says, on, Chris, on the Christmas tree of Christ's consciousness, hang your material desires to remain forever. Give unto Christ all your gifts of love and devotion. Let him, the capital H, on the Christmas morn of your spiritual awakening Unwrap the gorgeous present of your heart offerings that have been sealed with the tears of your golden joy and bound with the cord of your eternal fidelity to him. He accepts only the gifts of sacred soul dreams and his acceptance will be his greatest, his greatest gift to you. For if he gives anything to anyone, he gives nothing less than himself. In giving himself, he will make your heart big enough to hold him. Then your heart will throb with Christ in everything. Man, that would be great, wouldn't it? Um, in this, as for a lot of times, and we hear it, but we just forget the spirit of the season. But the one thing that we should probably also do is that we, we need to, everything that we have, if we think of our, what we earn, as his, and that we manage his, and that we need to get approval from him, it would not be so hard for us to give to him. Um, uh, so remember that um, the Lord, he's, we've learned he's a chief forgiver, and that um, we should have the desire to give to him. And when we give to others, charity, we actually give to him as well. So I want to remind you the different ways of giving that we have um, that could be done. You, there's a QR code um, that you could um, use that will give, bring you to the website and bring you to the, to the giving. You could text the word GIVE to 770-818-4323. Um, there's a box in the foyer. Um, and um, I... I go to the um, Adventist giving, and, I, and, I, and that's how I give. I find it's, it's easier for me. Um, let us um, bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your sacrifice. We ask, dear Lord, that um, you be with each one of us, that we remember that the season is not about satisfying ourselves with great gifts and things, but it is to be able to be like you and to give to others and to make others' lives richer. And also, Lord, um, that to give to you is a blessing. Lord, we ask you these things, and we ask that everything that's given be used in the way that you want it to be used, and it be beneficial to the church, and it may we be... Um, beneficial to this community. We ask you these things not that they're worthy, but in the name of Son Jesus, amen. We're going to have our children's story, and um, you'll see that there's an offering that's collected by the children. It goes towards the school's worthy student fund. Um, so as they come down, we're going to have Bill Valenti do the story today for us. Whenever Bill does the story, it's always a great story, and I look forward to it. So it should be a treat. So we ask our children to come down as, as um, um, Bill Valenti will give the story for us.
don't you? No. no. Huh. Well, you know what? We're going to have a quiz today. Just like in school. We'll make it easy, okay? Four questions, maybe five. All right. Here we go. What is this? It's a $1 bill. You can see George Washington right there. He's got, this is a pretty good one, actually. No folds in it. Yeah, we got all sorts of things going on. Uh, no folds. Brand, this was the best dollar bill that the bank had. The most nicest, shiniest, crispest, no folds or anything. Wait, how much is it worth? $1. $1. Okay. Well, that was easy. All right. Here's the next question. Ah, here we go. We mean, yeah. What is this? A one dollar bill. Doesn't look quite as nice as the other one, does it? It's got writing on it. Got a mud. It's all wrinkled. Looks like it's been burnt. Got some holes in it, a cut. How much is it worth? Wait, this is worth one dollar? You're saying it's worth zero dollars. Huh. So it's not worth anything? You know what? If I take this to the bank, they'll give me one of these for this. It's still worth the same thing. You know why? Because how valuable something is <laughs> is determined by what someone's going to pay for it. Right? If I have something and I look at it and I go, what's this? It looks like a stone. And I'm willing to just throw it away. And somebody says, that's a diamond. I'll pay you $10,000 for it. How much is it worth? $10,000 because someone's going to pay me that. You know, in two days, we're going to have Christmas. The trees, the lights, the presents. But there's more. God paid heaven for us. That's how much we're worth. God says, you know what? Heaven is not going to be worth it. If you are not there, or you, or you, or any of the grown-ups, the value of anything, including you and me, is what someone will pay for it. That's what Christmas is about. Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear Father, we thank you so much for this season. We thank you for the gift of your Son that you showed us that each of us is worth heaven itself. Amen.
with scripture reading today is taken from Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king behold wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying where is he who has been born king of the Jews for we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him may God bless the reading of his word Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. I just want to express that I'm joyful and always happy to be at church and to be in the presence of the Lord and being with my church family. And um, as we now transition into corporate prayer, I just want us to just think about all the things that we're grateful for, all the things that we're thankful for. And as we prepare to close out this year, just reflect on all the things that we're thankful for what the Lord have done for us in the past and all the things that he will be doing for us in the future. And I also want to say, Bill, thank you and praise the Lord for leading out the children's story and TT for just reading the scripture for us. We're just always blessed when the young people participate in, in special music or reading for us. And I will not forget how joyful I am to see, um, to hear the two piece that was done so wonderful by, just so wonderful. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity to just be here this morning. Um, Amelia, <laughs> thank you very much for leading out and playing for us. And as I stated, just take a, a second to just think about the things that the Lord has done for us in this past year and just be thankful in our heart for the things that he will be doing in the future for us. So I'm going to kneel for prayer. So please kneel if you're able to and just take a second to just reflect upon the things that the Lord has done for us throughout this year or in the past in our life and just be thankful for the things that he'll be doing for us in the future. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful to be able to come before thy presence. We're grateful for all that you provide for us each day. We're grateful for your protection throughout this year on our day-to-day -day travels, whether we go to school, whether we go to work. We even pray that you protect us from any danger that we may come in contact with within our work environment, Lord. We're just living in a very trying time in Earth's history, and we're just thankful for all that you do for us. We, we not always see the spiritual battle that's happening behind us and how you have your holy host of angels surround us and how you have them go before us and set the way for us, Lord. So sometimes we don't see how you are working mightily on our behalf. So we just want to thank you for that, Lord, because we have a tendency to just forget how you have led in the time, in time past and how you're leading now and how you will lead us in the future. So we will just want to thank you for all that you have done for us, how you have provided for all of us, both financially, um, sp spiritually, and we just want to be thankful for that as we close out the year. We know that there's always needs, Lord, and we know you know the, these needs, but we still ask you, Lord, to meet all our financial needs and continue to, continue to bless us spiritually, Lord. And those who are having any health issues in the church, we just pray that your comfort and spirit be with them and that you see them through according to your will, Lord, and allow us to just fixate upon you and your glory and your righteousness and, and you lead it in our lives, Lord. We pray now and just ask that our mind will not be distracted in any way and that we will fixate upon you and your glory and your righteousness on this Sabbath day as we take this time 
to just separate our mind and our thoughts away from this world and just focus on your glory and your righteousness and the love that you have for us. We pray that we may have no distraction here in the sanctuary, that your holy Joseph angel will work mightily and push back any influence from the hands of the wicked one and his host. And our heart will be, re be ready and prepared to receive the message that you have from upon high for us. We pray that you be with Elder Shelbert, Lord, and I pray that you pour out your spirit upon him. I pray that you give him physical and spiritual strength as he positioned himself today to be used by you to bring a message to us. I pray that we may receive it from up high and that we may prepare our hearts to receive it. I pray now, Lord, that you continue to be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church family, um, in deviating a bit from the norm, um, I want to introduce our speaker today, and um, known as uh, Shelbert Gaines. Um, might be new to many of uh, to, to many of you, but although he has a short tenure here, many of us have connected with him highly. Um, Elder Gaines. He leads our personal ministries department. Um, those of you don't know, he's ready, willing to accept new people and help. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, he's um, active, creative. He's a man of God, and he's um, he leads our men's ministry. Um, He's been happily married with his uh, favorite person, which is Kathy Gaines, for 40 years. He's an ordained elder. And um, when I asked um, Elder Gaines what he wanted me to say about him, because the church might not be not known so much, he, he says, I, I don't need a resume. I, I just need help um, that the Lord be with me, to connect with, with me. And he said, there's a quote that he has, he says, for him, when I stand before God at the end of my life, this is Elder Gaines, I would hope that I would have not a single bit of talent left and could say, I used everything you gave me. Um, moreover, Elder Gaines, um, he's on the first front pew, and we he's been suffering from back problems. Um, and normally he would be seated right here, uh, but we thought that maybe uh, getting up or down or something might have a hindrance. So that's, that's why he's sitting here and he'll come up right um, after. I say that to you because it's his first time that he's gonna be on the pulpit preaching since he's been experiencing the back problems. So let us pray for him that the Lord will hold up and that he will give us a message. I'm not worried about it. I know the Lord's gonna come through for him and that we're gonna have a global man. So with that in mind, let us um, um, hear, um, I'll leave you with Elder Gaines as he delivers the word for us. Elder Gaines. Thank you, Elder Villar, for all of your help late at night and early this morning. I think we were texting each other like two something this morning, trying to um, see how we would maneuver this uh, situation. Uh, to be a little bit more specific, I have been dealing with my some spine issues, spinal issues, and my I met with my neurosurgeon on Thursday and I have swelling on my spine above and beneath where I had surgery about 20 years ago. 
So thank God, he said on th this past Thursday, I don't have to have surgery, praise God, but I'm not out of the woods because I still deal with some weakness in my legs. Sometimes I'm not able to stand that well. Sometimes I'm, I, I can tell you, I, I can't even run. If I had to run, I, I literally can't do it. And, and it surprised me to realize that because I attempted it one day. But I just want to say thank you to Elder Villard for helping me. And I also want to take off my watch because my official throat clearer, meaning my wife, is not here because I always have her to clear her throat at a certain time so I don't go over. <laughs> it's, so, it's so funny how she says to me, I, I just love hearing her say this, when I'm speaking sometimes, she'll say, I, I really don't think you were breathing. I say, Kathy, you know I have to breathe because I enjoy speaking and sharing what I'm sharing. So she says, I, I really don't believe you were breathing. So I said, yes, I, yes, I breathe, dear. I, I just enjoy it. So. But anyway, long story short, I want to first thank Pastor Edgar for the kind invitation to be able to speak today. And a couple of other things I want to touch real quick. I made kind of an oversight when I said being married to my favorite person for 40 years. That, that's true. That's my wife. I call her literally my favorite person. My grandson says, I know Gigi's your favorite person. So that's, that's true. But my oversight was... I did not mention our children. Our daughter is here on the row there. Her name is Cashel. She's named after my wife and I, Kathy and Shelbert. Cashel, wave your hand one more time. Our daughter, Cashel. We have a son, Shelbert, which is my namesake. And then also those are our grandchildren there. Uh, Taylor is the oldest. Wave your hands, Taylor. And Carter is the little fellow there sitting next to his mother. And he always says his name is Carter with a K, so nobody gets confused. Carter with a K, Carter with a K. And also, Mr. Carota Shane, it's nice to see you as well, sir. Okay, let me make sure I didn't miss anything else. But one other thing I wanna touch before I go on and we get into the message, and I see it's about a quarter till, so I wanna sit down on time, but I wanna touch this. My prayer is that we always focus on ministry in my family. So even when I speak, I like to take just a few moments to talk about ministry. And what I'm speaking of specifically is, we have a ministry that deals with blood pressure monitors. We give them to people all the time because prevention is better than cure. Somebody ought to say amen. Prevention is better than cure. So we encourage people to check their blood pressures. Now, actually I have two bags on the front row there that after church, I'm going to give to one member and one visitor. Reason being is because we not only minister in the community, we minister in the family. Amen, somebody. We believe in doing both. So on this side, I'm just going to ask, is there a visitor on this side that does not regularly check your blood pressure and you don't have a monitor at home? On this side, a visitor. You raise your hand if you, so you don't, sir. So after, after, we, after church, I'll make sure when you come through the line, I'll give you the bag. Now, I'll tell you what's in the bag. In the bag, there's a book called Bible Readings for the Home. It's kind of like a concordance of the Bible. You can look at any, pretty much any topic you want. And then there's the blood pressure monitor. Then there's the information from the American Heart Association that deals with some of the specifics and guidance concerning uh, heart, uh, heart attack, stroke, blood pressure, all those kinds of things. So that's there. But the final thing I'm going to give you is an extra book. That's very important. Why? Because when we receive, when I minister, I not only by God's grace, and I stress by God's grace, seek to minister to people, I secondly seek to hopefully encourage them to minister to someone else. So that's why I'm giving you a book in the bag and then also an extra book. So hopefully as you're blessed, you share it with someone else, amen. Okay, so I'll give that to you as, the, as our visitor. Now on this side, I'm gonna ask for a member that does not regularly check your blood pressure at home. Any person, member, that does not check your blood pressure at home. All the members check your blood pressure? You do not check your blood pressure and you don't have a monitor at home. So I will give it to you when you come through the line and I will give you the same thing. Everything that's in the bag, including an extra book to share with someone else. 
Okay, let's, let's pray so we can get started. Let's pray. Father, we come here today leaning on the everlasting arms. I'm so thankful again publicly for Elder Villard who privately helped and we kind of worked out the logistics, so I'm thankful for that. And I just pray today as we share for a few moments that you would give us what we need. Father, you know the feelings in my legs and my back even right now. But we're just going to lean on you and we're going to sit down if we need to, but otherwise we're going to stand and make it through for the next 30 minutes by your grace. Please bless us today. Please encourage us today. Please challenge us today. Please help us, O oh Lord, to finish the work that you have given us to do. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Let everyone say amen and amen. I enjoy books. In fact, so much so that my family says to me on many occasions, whether it's a birthday or otherwise, you're not getting another book, but I still ask for the book. And I think, Chuck, you can identify because I heard you in Sabbath school talking about books. But there are some children's books that I enjoy as well. Maybe you're not familiar with them. There's a series called Character Classics that were actually written by our pioneers. And one of the books is called King's Daughters and other stories for girls. Actually, I'm going to order a copy and give to the children's department concerning the girls. There's also another one called Tiger and Tom and other stories for boys. And so these books actually teach marvelous lessons. In fact, sometimes I read them in family worship to our grandchildren, and sometimes I will take a story and share it in a sermon. That's where this title came from today, Nothing Finished. I'm going to read to you this brief story, and then we're going to dig into it a little bit more. Now, this is the story, Nothing Finished, from the book King's Daughters and Other Stories for Girls. And this is how the story goes. It says, I once had the curiosity to look into a little girl's work box, and what do you suppose I found? Well, in the first place, I found a bead purse about half done, about half done. There was, however, no prospect of finishing it, for the needles were out and the silk upon the spools all tangled and drawn into a complete wisp. Laying this aside, I took up a piece of perforated paper upon which was wrought one lid of a Bible and beneath it the words, I love. But what she loved was left for me to imagine. Beneath the Bible lid, I found a stocking evidently intended for some baby foot, but it had come to a stand just upon the little hill and there it seemed doomed to remain. Near to the stocking was a needle book, one cover, one cover, of which was neatly made, and upon the other, partly finished, was marked to my dear. I need not, however, tell you all that I found there, but this much I can say that during my travels throughout that work box, I found not a single article complete. And silent as, and dumb as these articles were, these half-finished, forsaken things told me a sad story about that little girl. They told me that with a heart full of generous affection, with a head full of useful and pretty objects, all of which she had both the means and the skill to carry into effect, she was still an unproductive child, always doing but never accomplishing her work. It was not a lack of industry but a lack of perseverance. Last paragraph. 
Remember, my dear little friends, that it matters but little what great things we undertake. Our glory is not in that, but in what we accomplish. Nobody in the world cares for what we mean to do, but people will open their eyes to see what men and women and little children have done. Again, the story's title is Nothing Finished. As I considered and prayed over and thought about speaking concerning the theme, which is hope is here, some things really struck me. Hope is here. The thought came to me, hope is where? Hope is where? I wonder if the people in our neighborhoods agree that hope is here. What do you think? Do you believe that our neighborhoods believe, just like we say during the month of December, that hope is here? Do you believe that they believe hope is here? About 14 days ago, an article was written. The title is Violence, Racism, Hate, and Corruption, the 10 Most Shocking Crimes of 2023 in the U.S. As I looked at the various crimes, all but one was gun related, all but one. And I also noticed as they went on in the article, they discussed sports, they discussed entertainment, they discussed so many different areas and something caught my attention. You know what really caught my attention? As they listed not only violence, but accomplishments. And as I looked and I scrolled and scrolled, you know the thing that struck me was, why has the church no place here? Why is the church not listed in the accomplishments of what went on in 2023? Have you read anywhere where it said that the church has done anything significant in the world? I'll say this as respectfully as I can because I have family members who believe this. I was reading during September when the Israel war began and during that time, many people said, we know that any day now we're gonna be raptured. We're gonna be taken out. And it really, really, I, I, it just troubled me. You know what it troubled me? Our neighborhoods, our families, the world is being utterly destroyed and there are millions of Christians that believe that God's highest concern is to come take them away while everything around them is being destroyed. Everything destroyed violence, craziness, shooting. I've lived in Atlanta for a long period of time and I have never in my life ever heard of so much shooting and crime and craziness going on in Atlanta. And we actually have Christians in the world that believe without picking on them, I'm not saying that. I'm talking about the mindset that says everything around me is being destroyed and I believe God in heaven wants to come get me and take me out and watch it happen. Every year about this time, it's interesting how I have friends, some people I know pretty well and some I don't. And I don't hear much from them, from them except during this time of year. And you know what I start hearing this time of year? That Christmas is pagan. Anybody ever heard that? Christmas is pagan. I mean, hey, if that floats your boat, fine. But what I wanna know is, 
You say Christmas is pagan if you're a Christian and you believe that that's what God expects you to do. Every year it starts right after Thanksgiving and goes up until Christmas. But my question is, if your message is that Christmas is pagan, then I want to know what ministry you were doing the other 11 months. The other 11 months of the year, what was your message then? Because if you only come out during Christmas time and say Christmas is pagan, then you're, uh, you have a lot more to worry about than just saying Christmas is pagan. Because if that's all that you believe as a Christian that God calls you to do is every year start, start talking about how pagan Christmas is, but yet you do no other ministry, you actually believe that that's all God wants you to do every year. And I, and I see a few smiles because you may have close associates like I do that believe that that's their number one job is to start talking about Christmas being pagan, but they do zero ministry the rest of the year. Why do we, my brothers and sisters, have so many things unfinished in our neighborhoods? Why is that? Is it possible that we're kind of like a football team that actually goes into the huddle but we never really come out. And then there are flags thrown. If you're familiar with sports, anybody familiar with what happens when you go in a huddle and you stay in too long? Anybody? I saw say, delay of game, delay of game. Do you think it's possible that we as a church, as a church are getting flags thrown from heaven because we're spending so much time in the huddle? We're delaying the game. No, really, no real plans to actually finish and accomplish anything. I want you to turn with me now to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And I have about 15 minutes. So I'm going to read this passage. Then we're going to go to Joshua 14. And we're going to share a few more points and we're going to be finished. Delay of game. Joshua chapter 4, verse 30. I mean, John chapter 4, thank you. Thank you. John 4, verse 30, and then Joshua 14. Thank you, sir. John chapter 4, verse 30. I still hear pages turning, so I'll wait until... I don't hear any more pages. John chapter four, verse 30, as we're considering nothing finished. This is Jesus dealing with his disciples. We're not gonna read the whole story because we're gonna move to J Joshua and look at that because we're gonna focus on one primary aspect of why it is that sometimes we're not finishing the job. Verse 30, it says, then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus said unto them, saith unto them. What did he say, everybody? My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to do what? Finish his work, finish his work. And the last verse 35 says, say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. Now let's go to Joshua, Joshua chapter 14. We're gonna look at the mindset of Caleb, one of my favorite, favorite Bible stories, Bible characters. And as you're turning there, I'm gonna read something to you. As you turn to Joshua 14, I have something on my phone called Master Class. I actually bought, purchased this uh, class, I guess it's called. And the other day I was looking at something. I actually shared this with my daughter. Now we're gonna to go to Joshua 14 here in just a moment because we have about 15 minutes left. And I ran into something where Martha Stewart was speaking. And she said something that actually stopped me in my tracks. You know what she said? 
She said, I want to talk to you about the mindset that it takes to build a billion dollar brand. And this is what she said. She said, I want to know what my limits are, but I also want to extend those limits in every way possible. And I said, wow, she's running a company and that's her mindset. And I said, is that the mindset that we have as a people? Let's go to Joshua 14. I want to look at Caleb in these last 15 minutes. Look at Caleb. Love this story. Absolutely love it. Beginning at verse 6 of Joshua 14, as we move toward a close. And it says in verse 6, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. He's telling his testimony of his previous experiences and what God promised him. Let's move on. Verse 9, And Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land whereup on thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, watch closely now, as he said, these 45 years. What he's going to do is unpack before us his mindset that has been the same way for about 45 years. He's also going to tell us here why it's that way. Look at his mindset. These 45 years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day four score and five years old. Verse 11, as yet, we're moving up to the punchline now, as yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, 45 years ago, even so is my strength now for war both to go out and come in. And my question is, why, Caleb? Why is your mindset and your body and all of these things as strong as they ever were 45 years ago? Can anybody in here say, if you're that old, I'm sure some of you, I see young people in here, are you as strong as you were 45 years ago? I'm not. I, I'm having issues standing here right now. I'm not as strong. He was as strong physically, but also spiritually and mentally, and he's going to tell us why. And this is what we want to focus on in these last 10 minutes or so. Because, my brothers and sisters, I truly believe that we will find ourselves with nothing finished concerning the work that God would have us to do unless we adopt this kind of mindset. Watch what he says now in verse 12. He says, now therefore, 45 years later, now therefore, give me this mountain. Give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day 45 years ago. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there. Does anybody know who the Anakims were? They were giants. That's what scared off the other guys. How the Anakims were there and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave Caleb the son of Jephunneh Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he followed 
holy the Lord his God. In verse 15, and the name of Hebron before was Kerjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. Let's move now over to 15, and we're going to wrap, say a few points, and we'll be finished. 15, beginning at verse 13. Pay attention to what he says. This, this is just amazing. So exciting how what he says. Now he, he told them, give me this mountain and watch what happens now. Verse 13 of chapter 15. And unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part among the children of Judah, Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua. Even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, Anak, which city is in, he in Hebron. Now watch what he does. Verse 14, and Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai and Ahiman and Talmai, the children of Anak. What it's telling us is he dealt with giants and he got rid of three giants because his mindset was as strong as it was 45 years ago. Why? Because his mindset was, Lord, give me this mountain. That was his mindset. He wanted the mountains. He didn't want the valleys. He didn't want the easy task. He wanted the expanse. He wanted that which would challenge him and cause him to grow. But also watch how he deals with his posterity in this text. In verse 15, and he went up thence to the inhabitants, inhabitants of Debir. Did you notice that it says he went up? This is almost totally unrealistic. He's fighting giants going uphill. Do, do you see it in the text? He went up from thence fighting giants going uphill. That's the kind of faith he had. He fought giants and even fought them going uphill. He went up from thence to the inhabitants of Debir and the name of Debir before was Kerjath Sefer. And Caleb said, this is so important with our children. And Caleb said, he that smiteth Kerjath Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Axa my daughter to wife. What is he saying? He's saying, I don't need any real interview with anybody who wants to marry my daughter because I fight giants and my mindset is give me this mountain. We don't have to talk it over. If you want my daughter, take that territory and you can have her. That will answer for me your qualifications. Amen, somebody. That's what he's saying. If you really want my daughter, go handle your business. I, we don't have to talk it over because if you're worth a dime, you will take that territory. And because I do it all the time, I know what it takes to do it. We don't have to have any discussions. But also watch how his actions, you hear what I said? His actions affect his daughter's mindset. This was so convicting to me. Watch how his actions affect his daughter's mindset. Now it says, verse 17, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it and he gave him Axa, his daughter, to wife. Now watch what his daughter does. I love this. Verse 18, and it came to pass as she came unto him that she moved him to ask of her father a field. Why is that her mindset? Because what she's saying is, when I watch my daddy, he never stayed idle. He kept moving forward. So she gets some territory and watch what else she does. She moved him to ask her father a field. Then she lighted off her ass and Caleb said unto her, what wouldest thou? Who answered, give me a blessing for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. What is that saying? It's saying because my daddy was always progressing, once he gave me something, I'm going to ask him for more because my mindset is to keep moving, keep moving, keep progressing, keep taking territory. His daughter was affected and influenced by his progressive movements. My brothers and sisters, I just want to say to you in these last about five minutes that we have, what is your mindset? I sit and think about our church and see the meetings, whether it's the NAD, the General Conference and all the rest. And even when you consider what your plans are for your community, are your plans, give me this mountain, which means 
I plan to take the community in which I live and finish the work, or is your mindset just to kind of, kind of just stay about where you were last year with no change of thinking? Our church was officially established in 1863, and we're still here without the work finished. Nothing finished. Now, I'm not saying we're not doing anything. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is in our planning, even here at Atlanta North, are the plans to finish something in this community, finish the work? What does that plan look like? Or is it just let's do a few things and brighten the corner where we are? Are we planning on finishing it and then moving on to a new territory? Are our plans saying to God, Lord, give me this mountain? Is that what our plans are? What are your plans, my brothers and sisters? I'm going to tell you a story and close in these last three minutes. Um, I remember years ago when my wife and I first got married, we used to always travel to Texas. And it's about 16 hours in a car. I mean, it's every bit of 16 hours. That's if you just stop for gas. But I'll tell you an amazing lesson that happened to me years later when I was doing a study on the Holy Spirit. It's one of my favorite topics to study. And I remember when I was doing this study on the Holy Spirit that the Lord brought this thought to my mind about our travels to Texas to drive home the point to me about the Holy Spirit. And I hope you will get it as by the grace of God, he gave it to me. The thoughts just start coming to my mind. You remember when you used to drive to Texas? Yes, I'm thinking, you know, over my notes or whatever. How much gas did you need when you drove to Texas? How much did you, when you went to the gas station, how much did you get? Well, Lord, I fill it up, 16 hour ride, okay. Well, occasionally you just kind of stay in the neighborhood how much gas do you get when you're in the neighborhood? Do you always fill up? Well, no, sometimes I'm in a hurry, sometimes I don't have any cash, sometimes whatever. So I put $5 in the tank, okay? Now here's the lesson I wanna give you, it's driving in my, mind, in my mind. The thing you gotta remember is, Shelburne, it's kinda like I'm the gas station. And every day you come before me praying for the Holy Spirit that you're studying about. You needed a full tank to go all the way to Texas, and otherwise you could just put a little gas in the car. Every day you come before me and you pray for the Holy Spirit, my question to you is, how much gas do you need? The Holy Spirit, how much do you need? What it's saying is, is that if you don't get a feeling from God, it's a strong and tender rebuke to you that you don't need much gas for what you're doing. Why would he fill you up if you don't plan on traveling as far as Texas in ministry? Sometimes we're riding around with our spiritual lights on and we're praying and praying, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. And God says, well, with, with the current ministry plans that you have, do, is there a territory you plan on finishing? Is there something worth filling you up for? that you actually have in your plans. Sometimes people will say to me, Elder Gaines, we're having an all night prayer meeting. And I'm like, there's nothing wrong with that, but what plans are you carrying out as a result of praying all night? Because God is more than willing to give his Holy Spirit to you, but he doesn't waste gas. And you can stay up all night if you want, but if you have no plans, you probably should just go home and go to bed. And many times our church has meetings and conferences and we're still here, unfortunately, with a lot of things unfinished. So I say to you and to myself, may God help us to be like Caleb and say, Lord, give me this mountain. Because there are way too many things in our neighborhoods that are unfinished. Please stand for our closing hymn.
Father, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your patience, your mercy, your kindness, and your love toward each one of us. And I just pray that we will have the mindset of Caleb, where we will say every day, Lord, give me this mountain. Help us, O oh Lord, to go forward. May our faith grow. May we have a mind that's focused on finishing the work instead of just brightening, brightening the corners where we are. Be with us as we go to our separate places of, of abode. And we just thank you for this time together. And I just thank you as well for being with me and enabling me to stand here today. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated.